Okay, so our next talk starts, and uh, since it's um, two minutes late, and the talk after brunch will also start two minutes late. Okay. Let's start. Yeah. Okay. Th th thanks, Rachel. Uh, so hi, I'm Brent Waters. I'm going to be talking about a um, punctured programming approach to adaptively secure uh, functional encryption. And so let me just start by talking very briefly, briefly about functional encryption. Uh, this is a way of thinking of encryption that b moves beyond the all or nothing decryption semantics of traditional public key encryption. Um, in the system, what we want to do is endow this user Alice with a secret key, which doesn't let her necessarily see the whole message, but lets her learn a um, particular function um, of the message. So we'll have an authority which generates a master secret key public parameter pair, keeping the master secret key to herself. She'll um, generate then a secret key F for Alice. And Bob, if he encrypts a message M, and this eventually the ciphertext gets to Alice, she can learn um, the function F of M on the message. So this might be something like she learns if the, um, an encrypted email was um, spam or not, but doesn't learn anything uh, more than that, for example. Okay, and then you know, the progression of works that led to this, and around 2008 we first started using the term functional encryption, sort of changed it over um, from predicate encryption. Okay, so to explain the state of the art in functional encryption, I think it helps to kind of look um, sort of pre-obfuscation, this whole obfuscation explosion and post. Um, so pre-obfuscation, there were sort of two different flavors. One was this attribute-based encryption, where there'd be this payload we wanted to hide, and we have this, this metadata which we like sort of evaluate the function over, but this metadata itself wasn't, um, is tied to the ciphertext but not hidden, so at first we could do things like Boolean formulas on it, and then eventually we're able to, um, especially this neat GVW work, we're able to um, move to circuits, which was pretty neat. Okay, but that only hides this payload. Then for kind of true functional encryption, um, we were limited to things like doing a dot product where the cif ciphertext and both the key were these vectors. We could do a dot product test, test if it's zero or not, um, which you, know, you can build so many things off of that, but it's um, still a far cry from, let's say, polynomial size circuits. Um, then off, uh, when obfuscation came along in this GGH RSW paper, um, what we're also able to show there is that if you combine indistinguishability obfuscation with a um, special type of um, simulation sound NISICs, you could get functional encryption, or at least um, what we call selectively secure functional encryption. This is where an attacker that says, okay, you cannot distinguish, or attacker says, I can distinguish between these two messages, he's forced to declare these two messages before even seeing the public parameters. Um, so it's kind of a useful model for, for I mean, it, you know, it, it's a challenge to, to get to this point, but um, you know, ideally we want it to be um, adaptive. Okay, so for this talk, um, I try to answer these two questions. Um, in some sense, can we build a better functional encryption system, one that is um, A, simpler, and hopefully without this um, extra NISIC type primitive around? And the second one um, is, can we make it adaptively secure? That is, can we get a polynomial time reduction um, from, from our system to the underlying, uh, with polynomial loss to the underlying indistinguishability obfuscation? Okay, so to present this talk, uh, I have this really two results here. Uh, the first one is gonna be a simple, um, selectively secure functional encryption system um, that comes from um, IO, indistinguishable obfuscation plus one-way functions. Um, actually, it's a little more secure than that. Um, we actually can do it for this semi-adaptive thing where all private key queries come after the challenge ciphertext, so a little bit better than the selective, uh, but I'll just call it selective. Uh, Second, um, we're gonna present uh, the first, actually, that came in the literature, adaptively secure FE scheme that comes from indistinguishability obfuscation plus injective one-way functions. And to present this talk, uh, what I wanna do is first go into the selective construction proof so you can get some idea of these kind of punctured programming machinations used to um, get around and all this stuff. Um, second, for the adaptive one, just due to, in some sense, how complex it is and, and, and time constraints, I'm more gonna give you an overview of the main ideas which I would say the central idea there was um, we can take a one-time secure, like a one-bounded scheme that is adaptively secure and kind of connect this with a selective-ish techniques to get um, full adaptive security end-to-end, -end. And, and this is actually, and then finally I kind of actually just make a couple remarks, we'll sure hear a good talk from Prabhanjan on how um, this bootstrapping technique can be simplified and kind of made better and, and, and stuff like that. Um, okay, so for selectively secure functional encryption, let me first go over the, um, basic definitions and tools we're gonna to use. Uh, functional encryption scheme, again, has um, four algorithms set up, encrypt, key gen, and decrypt. They have roughly sem the semantics I talked about earlier. Um, informally, correctness says that uh, if we have a ciphertext that encrypts a message M, and if I have a secret key for F, and I execute decrypt, I will learn F of M, okay? 
And security, I try to shove it into, um, you know, let's say half a slide here for this indistinguishability game. Um, here what we basically have is that the challenger will give the public parameters to the attacker. Attacker can query for secret keys from many different functions. And then it submits two, and, and gets the, these secret keys. And then it submits two messages, M0 and M1, with the constraint that um, for each function, F of M0 must equal F of M1. Otherwise, the system could be trivially distinguishable just using the natural power you get from the secret keys. Okay, um, then the challenger does the usual thing. It flips a random coin, B, um, encrypts the message M sub B. Uh, we can ask for more private key queries with the same constraints, and the attacker's job is to um, guess B prime, and his advantage is the probability he does this over one half. Okay, so uh, in some sense, the usual definition. And selective security is where we sort of, where we move this um, selection thing up to step zero. Um, you know, ahead of seeing the public parameters. So um, in some sense, the, the security game here, the adaptive one seems like the right one, and we'd like to be able to um, get to there, and of course, without using sub-exponential hardness assumptions and this kind of usual trick. Okay, so um, the first tool, if you guys haven't, uh, uh, I guess we even have a song about it now, um, is indistinguishability obfuscation. And um, so the idea is that we can take some original program, Run it, through, run it through some obfuscator compiler and get out a functionally equivalent program, but one that should hide it in a certain way. And uh, the definition for indistinguishability obfuscation, which I guess is the most believable one in a sense, um, is that if I have two circuits C0 and C1 that are functionally equivalent, they give me the same output on every single input, then you cannot tell whether I gave you an obfuscation of C0 or I gave you an obfuscation of C1. Okay, now to build upon this, we're gonna use this punctured programming ish technique um, introduced by Mitzahai and myself in 2014, where we want to like sort of the methodology, you remove a key, ran, a key element of a program that doesn't change the functionality, but it makes an attacker hard to win with it. Uh, the uh, mechanism for this will be, um, the, the main tool will be this punctured pseudorandom function, which is really like a pseudorandom function, but I can give you a punctured version of it. I can give you a punctured version at x star, and that basically says that you can evaluate the function everywhere except for x star, and moreover, at the point of x star, you cannot tell the difference between the function's output at x star and just a truly random value. Okay, that, that's the idea of a pseudo-random function. And this can be built um, from one-way functions, GGM tree, uh, that, type of, uh, that type of deal. Uh, the second thing I'm gonna have is a slightly higher level abstraction, which I can build from puncturable PRFs. Uh, I'll call it PDE. And this is a deterministic encryption system. This is gonna be a tool I'm using to build other stuff. And um, you know, it has the usual encryption, decryption semantics. But I can also give you a punctured version of this. And here I puncture on two messages. And what this means, essentially the puncture key means if I puncture on M0 and M1, that means you can decrypt ciphertext for any other message other than M0 and M1. Remember, there's only one ciphertext per message because it's deterministic. And moreover, if I show you a uh, ciphertext for M0 and one for M1, but I don't tell you which is which, you cannot tell. Okay, so I puncture this. Um, an encryption from M0 is ambiguous relative um, to an encryption for M1. Okay, so that's gonna be our other tool which we're gonna um, be using to make this, and we can um, you know, derive it fairly simply from uh, previous work, I'll, I'll mention. Okay, so let's, um, let's actually see the selectively secure um, system. I'll give it a little bit of detail as I said. So first of all, the, pu the public parameters are gonna be this program obfuscated. So they're gonna include a puncture PRE K, and pretty much what this program will do is just take an input R, and um, do a, let's say, length doubling pseudorandom generated t, and evaluate um, the pseudorandom function on t to get a small k will actually be a PDE, a punctual deterministic key um, k. Um, actually, let, let's skip the secret key for a second and go to encryption. So to encrypt the message, I'm just going to choose a random value r and run it into my program, which will give me an output some tag value t and a corresponding k. Okay, so that's how I'm going to encrypt, is just feed it into this program. Now, um, the secret key for function f, um, what it will do is if you give it a tag t, it will actually c compute that PDE secret key k, like as f of capital K comma t, and then it will um, decrypt the ciphertext, um, decrypt the c that you give it, so this is a PDE ciphertext c, so it sort of decrypt it under the system, and then evaluate the function on it, the function f on it, and give you that output, okay? So, um, so we have the, um, public parameters, which are just, encryption is pretty much just feeding in a random value into the public parameters. Oh, and, and then, so once you do that, um, you should encrypt, use that to encrypt it on the message M under the PDE system. Sorry about that. And um, the secret key is something that decrypts this PDE, kind of figures out from the tag what this PDE secret key is and applies the function on that. 
Okay, so not too complicated as far as um, things um, as far as things go. And um, now I'd like to just kind of give you an overview of like kind of how these security proofs and these puncture programmings uh, sort of look. So here's the first security. This is sort of the security game instantiated um, with our concrete scheme. So here we have the public parameters from our scheme, um, the secret key from our scheme, and there's going to be some challenge ciphertext, which will be generated by choosing R star randomly and saying T star is equal to PRG of R star. This is all done honestly. And then we're going to get this K star, which is this PD key, and encrypt the message M sub B under it. Okay? And what I want to do is I want to create a sequence of games where I say the attacker cannot tell the difference between these games, but I'm slowly going to make it hard to actually win in this game. Okay? So the first step I'm going to do is a simple PRG step, where instead of choosing R star randomly and deriving T pseudo randomly, um, I'm just going to choose T star, which will, let's say, be two M bits. I'm going to just choose it randomly. And by PRG security, the attacker's advantage shouldn't be any better in this game than the previous one. Uh, the important point, though, is that now T star is out, with high probability, T star is outside of the range of the PRG. OK? Uh, whoops. Uh, OK, so step two, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take away the ability to um, evaluate the PRF on T star from this public parameter program. And this can be done from indistinguishability obfuscation. The main point is that since T star is outside of the range of the PRG, this program will never need to actually use this. So it's OK to cut it out. This is almost like extra fat. Uh, and this is like a common technique in puncture programming. Since T star um, is likely, very likely not in the range of the PRG, taking away this capability doesn't hurt the, uh, doesn't change the public parameters program, but it takes away this kind of knowledge in, in a sense. Uh, then the second thing, it's a more com little more complicated step. Um, on this tag T star, which, um, which is for the encryption tag, I'm going to sort of hardwire in how you're supposed to decrypt these messages C0 and C1. So here for C0 and C1 correspond to encryptions of either M0 and M1. But no matter what one you see, you don't actually kind of do what you normally do. You just hardwire in the output. And you're able to do this because by the rules of the game, f of m0 is equal to f of m1. OK? So um, if t is equal to t star, then you just kind of hardwire the output. Otherwise, um, you can, you know, otherwise if t is equal to t star are not those, you do the decryption of the PDE. And otherwise, you just derive some other key. OK? Um, OK, and then um, the steps after that, uh, since, we punctu since we kind of punctured all these things out, we're able to um, derive this k star here, not from the punctual PRF. We're able to do it randomly. And then once we have that, we can finally apply the security of the PDE scheme. And I can change m sub b to always be an m sub 0 and kind of lose all information about the bit b. OK, so I know I this went through um, fairly fast, but uh, I hope this at least kind of gives a you know, some sense, uh, relatively simple hybrids, you know, five steps. That's kind of the whole proof. Um, so it's a fairly simple, selectively secure scheme. Uh, we kind of take these capabilities to evaluate outside. We cut it out of the public parameters. We hardwire the key. And once we kind of hardwire in what you're supposed to be doing, we can um, kind of flip the message. OK? Um, OK, so that is, the, um, that is the selectively secure scheme, in a sense, in a nutshell. And now we get to the, um, OK, the main, in some sense, the main result is how do we do it from adaptively secure? And uh, so the good news is I won't try to torch you with another uh, 15 steps of punctured PRF hybrids um, for this one. But instead, of what I want to do is kind of give you the, the high-level idea of, um, of how we do things. OK, so at the highest level, what we're going to do is we're going to combine selective-ish, for some definition of selective-ish, um, indistinguishably obfuscation techniques, which we saw some of in the previous slides, Along with, um, it was open whether we could do adaptively secure functional encryption, but if we do this one bounded case, this case where you only give away, let's say there's only one ciphertext and only one private key, this was actually known from, um, this, this was actually um, known from previous work, like the, the GVW scheme. Okay, so we actually have this, but for this, like, um, the case we're not usually aiming for is this one bounded, we want unbounded or uh, unbounded inclusions, but we can actually make use of this as a tool and we can kind of bootstrap or combine these to get an adaptively secure functional encryption scheme. And so the way it kind of looks, um, I'll give you like kind of one snapshot of how things are going on. Um, so a ciphertext for message M would be a pair of a tag T, and along with an the, the, the ciphertext will embed somehow the tag T in a message M, and the secret key for function F will be associated with a different tag Y, and will somehow embed the function F, I, I guess along with Y too, I should say. 
okay? And the idea that is that um, these are kind of our ciphertexts, and what they're gonna do, instead of um, kind of decrypting or evaluate the function directly, they're gonna generate um, one bounded ciphertext. So we're gonna tell you, take these obfuscated programs, instead of doing the job directly, they're gonna kind of generate a fresh, in a sense, fresh relative to these tags, one bounded schemes, and then have the one bounded schemes actually do the work of decryption. So uh, the first step, what we'll have here, is this key obfuscated program will take in the ciphertext tag T, um, and what it will do is it will produce a, a, a one-time functional encryption key itself relative to um, a key that's kind of generated from the pair Y comma T. So it sort of pseudo-randomly generates a one-time system key relative to the uh, pair of tags, not just one type, pair of tags Y and T for the function F, and also develops what I'll call a signal alpha sub Y T here. Um, now for the second step, we're gonna feed the tag of the secret, of the secret key along with the signal that was generated Signal source says it's okay to go ahead um, to this obfuscated ciphertext, and this will generate a one-time functional encryption ciphertext um, for the message M. And also, importantly, this kind of subscript YT means for the same one-time key. Like the one-time key is kind of pseudo-randomly generated from this P pair Y comma T. Okay, well now that I have these two things, I have a one-time functional encryption key, a one-time functional encryption ciphertext, I can just run the decryption algorithms of these one-time existing schemes themselves, and I can do this one-time decryption algorithm and get f of m, okay? So this is this um, kind of bootstrapping going on. Instead of dealing with it directly, we, we generate these one-time schemes. Okay, now, um, again, I won't have time for the actual proof, but let me give a couple highlights from it. Uh, first of all, uh, kind of one, there's many hybrids actually between each one I'll show you here, but we sort of embed and challenge the message m sub b. And then what we do is, in the ciphertext, in addition to embedding m sub b in there, the, the, the challenge message, we also embed always m sub zero, no matter what the bit is, kind of in this unused space at first, kind of doing nothing. And then what we do is we change the signal that I showed from the previous slide in each key. I change it one by one for each key. And the signal before said, hey, use this message, um, use your normal message. And now the signal kind of says, um, no, use this alternative previously unused message to decrypt. So I keep on changing the keys to say to use the different message in the system. And at the end, after I change all these keys, it's actually this um, first part that's unused. And then we can kind of excise it out so that no information about the bit B is left, okay? Um, now, of course, this is very um, high level. Um, and you know, as many, you know, to actually execute this, you have, it was kind of a, a bit of a pain. Um, I, I will remark that it's the step two of changing the signals where kind of most of the action happens, where we, um, uh, but you know, I guess step two caused uh, the most pain in a sense. Um, okay, so, uh, uh, so for the final part of the talk, I just wanna conclude by saying, you know, I think, you know, it's one thing, one good thing is, you know, just to get out this adaptively secure from IO scheme, but I think the, in some sense, the idea that I think will, will last, um, you know, of course, everything gets improved upon, you know, over time, is this idea of taking a one bounded scheme and bootstrapping from it, you know, kind of taking a complicated mechanism and, and uh, so in some sense, yeah, not doing the, the decryption directly. And something we'll, we'll, we'll hear obviously more detail in a little bit uh, is this, um, this ABSV paper, which we'll hear about next, um, kind of had a neat um, different way of, of looking at it, which um, the way I kind of saw it, and, and I'm sure Prabhanjan will, will give you a, a much um, better insights and all that stuff, is that the first thing they do, they kind of flip the way we do bootstrapping. And this flipping um, made it a lot simpler, uh, which, you know, kind of kick myself for a little bit late, later on, but you know, in the way I did bootstrap, there were kind of two big, th two heavy primitives: obfuscation on the key side and obfuscation on the ciphertext side. And you can kind of, if you look, look at it in a different way, you can get only heavy stuff like an obfuscation type program on only on the key side and just a one-time thing on the ciphertext. Um, and then, you know, once you kind of make that flip. Um, then you know, instead of obfuscation being the heavy thing, you could have like, uh, they'll show you how to do a selectively secure thing. Now again, just like the previous steps here, actually you know, much easier um, said than done, so we'll get to see a lot of the kind of um, neat mechanisms and, um, and, and stuff to do it. Okay, and you know, I'm sure uh, Prabhanja and, and Zviko over there will be able to uh, give you better insights um, from what I remember. Okay, uh, thank you very much. <laughs>